Welcome everybody to the Open Studios Club. And I want all of you to pick up your brushes, your pens, start working while I go over some housekeeping. This is how we're going to do it. In terms of speaking, this is a little bit different than a workshop because in the workshops, those of you who have done them, we have specific amounts of time, things we want to hit, but this is super chill. For example, you can just hang out here, work and listen, maybe type, and you can come here and never speak on voice. That's totally fine. Some people prefer to just listen and of course type into the chat. There's plenty of interaction in there as well. And if you don't want to ask on voice, but you have a question, you can type that question into Open Studio's chat. Make sure you tag me, and I'm happy to answer any of those questions on voice. So at, right now, if everybody could go into the chat and just type if you want to talk or if you are just listening, that would be really helpful for me so I can see who I should be calling on and who I should not be. Something you want to talk about, but it could be a sensitive topic for some people, please make sure you provide a trigger warning. In terms of where to post your stuff, you can post that in Open Studio's chat. It is very helpful if all of you are conversing together, if you're trying to reply to somebody saying to do reply, because what's really nice about this channel is it's gonna be here. So after the session, if you want to go back and maybe there's some link that you wanted to find or you want to send something to somebody, make sure you tag them. I know some people find looking at the chat to be a little bit distracting. So some people will just listen and just do their work. And then afterwards, they will go back and look at the chat. It's totally up to you. Sometimes it's a little bit easier. I've had some people ask me about what to work on. My experience in the first session, I thought I'm going to try <laughs> be a guinea pig for my own program. And I sat down and did something small and something that had to be done, but didn't require that much brain power. I found that in terms of practical use to be the easiest thing to do. Of course, everybody is totally different. And certainly maybe some of you are very good at using your brain cells <laughs> all the time. But for me, I, I like that casual space out. And so I just posted here in the chat, this is this border that I've been working on. And I started it on the club session and then got excited and finished it. And this is the type of thing, I've been putting this up forever. It's been sitting on my desk for three weeks. And so just pulling it out, working on it very casually during the club session, I found I was able to finish it. And so sometimes for a lot of people, the purpose of Open Studios Club, a session, is not about being hyper productive or about polishing work. Sometimes for some people, the club session is just a starting point because I do think that oftentimes the toughest thing for people is getting up and starting. And so once you got it going, I mean, I found myself, I worked on this border a good hour after the session because I was far enough along that I really wanted to finish it. So some people use it that way, but use the session however you want. I think for a lot of people, it has to do with accountability. Sometimes it is hard to carve out time to make your work. There's always something else. For me, the laundry is always waving at me all day. But when you know this is a time period that is dedicated to my work, that can sometimes for a lot of people feel much easier from a practical point of view. Technically, you can take a break anytime you want. That's totally up to you. Last time I forgot to take a break, <laughs> so, but you guys can take a break anytime you want. We're, we're supposed to take an official 10 minute break halfway through, assuming that I remember, but I'm okay sitting here. That's totally fine with me. All right. So Sarah, a bit later on. Okay, sure. 
Yeah, if anybody has specific things with the schedule, if you can only stay for an hour, nobody has to stay here up until the very end. I mean, of course, you're welcome to do that. But the purpose of Open Studios Club, in my mind, is something that is extremely low pressure where you are working along, whereas the live streams, when we do a draw along, we have a lot of people who work with us, but usually the emphasis that we try to push is the actual draw along itself. This is really pushing your independent projects and just sharing the range of voices and topics. Okay, Mildred, if you would like to type that big question, I'm happy to do that, but I will check in with people. Okay, Mims says, might pipe and talk typing, a bit challenging, last minute change, no problem. N nobody's getting graded, <laughs> so none of you have to worry about that. Oh, Lisa, hop on voice. I'd love to hear about your graphic design experiments. Hey. Hey. Hi there. Play with the devices. Of course. Yeah. Boy, as you know, digital and me are not, we are not good friends. <laughs> we, we live in the same neighborhood. <laughs> we wave, you know. But, Lisa. I don't know. Do, do, do mm. you run down the other street when you see them coming like me in digital? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. Yes. Yeah, sometimes I do. Uh, yeah. Avoid. <laughs> Yeah, but and yeah, it's a, I'm not going to try to do any text design. I, that was maybe a little too, that's that brain thing you said. Yep. That's maybe too far today. Mm -hmm. Are you using Procreate? Um, I am using a, um, an app called Sketchbook. It's on my Android um, pad. I, I don't, I don't have an iPad. Okay. Are you using... So it is a raster program. Are you using a stylus or is this all with your finger? I have a stylus, yes. The Android thing, uh, it's a Samsung and it came with a, a, a decent stylus. Cool. Are you thinking that you will just play with this one or did you want to do more? I know you have these wonderful spreads of so many fast thumbnails or do you want to tweak more today? Hmm. I think, I think I like tweaking. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I think I like doing multiple ones. I think, oh, well, that's good. You know, try something else. Just, duh. but if there's a one that you think, oh, rip on that one, I'll, I, you know, I'm, I'm open. Okay. I am interested in the transparency that's happening. And it's interesting because I actually think the transparency is working better where the value range is a lot more limited. Like the upper right hand corner has a pretty limited range. And maybe you can think about getting really subtle transparencies. You'll have to take mm. a look at it. But if I look at the lower left hand corner, it could be that the value range got a little bit too bright because of course you have that very, very dark, dark. But there, I feel like mm -hmm. there's less depth than what's happening in the upper right. You know, one of the things your um, your 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 tutor, your uh, <laughs> Ashley said was stuff like maintaining a zone someplace where you could put. You know, I put the word war everywhere. You know, uh -huh. like that was the title of the movie or whatever. But she mentioned something about maintaining a zone where you could put all the the little spiel that you got to throw on a on a poster. Yes. I have been I discovering that. that I am actually not very good with negative space. <laughs> I feel like my natural impulse mm. is to want to fill. And I'm not good mm -hmm. at these compositions that have just sweeping areas of negative space. But because they are well designed, the negative space doesn't seem empty or it doesn't seem unbalanced. Mm. I think I have your same issue. I, yeah. Leaving that black down there. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I don't, I don't I, I apparently was not, I mean, I knew I was supposed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you Maybe could that's try a good tweak this to try. Is working in a reductive manner. So, okay, we have the images we have here. 
and maybe mm. you create variations where with every variation you remove more and more and more and you push it beyond what you're comfortable with. Because I saw this incredible movie poster. It's called The Zone of Interest. It's a film. I don't know if it's out right now, but I'm going to drop the image into the chat. And I think 75% of the poster is all black negative space. And I looked at that and I thought to myself, I would never have the guts to have that much negative space. Mm -hmm. But it sure is good, isn't it? It is. It's extremely powerful. And I, I'm realizing that I need to make a composition like that because I don't think I've ever done something like that before. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on this. And I'm, I don't do this either. I saw um, a painting today in which the person had uh, done a, uh, where, where the trees were overhanging into the view and, and they were just pure black and white and, uh, or black. And then, and I just thought, she was so brave to fill so much of that space with that foliage, that black foliage. That, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll try that. Cool. All right. Nice to see your start, Lisa. Yeah. Okay. Now, if people have stuff they want a reply to fairly soon, let me know in the chat. You can just tag me. But if it's nothing that you need fairly soon, just know I'll go through the list of people to make sure that everybody gets talked to at some point. Okay, so Mildred has a question they are asking. My goal today is design of a deity as a serious character. In other words, the game Smite or superhero media. When a deity has very few surviving tales to work with, how do you craft a recognizable presentation? How do you experiment with concepts? Okay, so you're playing with colors, shapes of elements controlled, poses like animals. I'm autistic, so I have to rely on scripts like this. Oh, I find all of that information incredibly helpful, especially with character design. There's just so many details to the story that you have. Do you have a... Okay, so bear with the old part. <laughs> Is this a character you're designing from a game? Or is this a character that you are making up entirely yourself? Because this is the type of thing where you have to boil it down to the aspects of the character that are really, really important. And you have to sift out the little details, which is hard to do sometimes, especially when you have a character that is fairly complex. So Mildred, if you can type a reply to that, or if you'd like to talk on voice about that, that's okay too. But tag me if you do want to talk on voice. Otherwise, you can type your reply to that. Already, everybody, we're getting this wonderful flood of images. And I just love seeing all of that range. How about Nandy? Hop on voice. Let's talk about your flowers. Hello, can you hear me? Hey. Yes, I can. So what's on the okay. table for today? Well, I'm trying to do some thumbnails for um, for uh, an art show that's exhibition that's going to come up soon. And I haven't <laughs> done anything yet. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, I'm just working through some thumbnails and I'm trying to avoid cliches with flowers. Okay. Um, so what I'm working through is... Um, I've decided I don't want to use color mm -hmm. and so I'm sticking with black and white because when you think of florals, you think of something that's very vibrant and very alive and, you know, and I want something that's kind of cold and distant. I've kind mm. of decided to have narrowed that down into something that's, yeah, kind of isolated cool. from that, you know, with that idea. Yeah. So anyways, that's what I'm working with so far. And do you have references that you are drawing from? Well, yeah, actually, I had someone actually bought, I had, I had someone, um, I, I lost someone recently. Oh, I'm sorry. And so, I, I, oh, it's okay. Um, I've had some, a lot of flowers, and so I'm using those flowers as, as reference. 
okay. to to that individual. Yeah. I love Work. Andy that this is such a departure from what we expect when there are flowers because more often than not flowers are vibrant and beautiful and luscious looking and it's interesting these are very small thumbnails they're not that developed mm -hmm. but i right. already see the mood isn't that amazing that you've already captured that in such a small sketch and i think a big part of it is the engagement with the background so do you see the thumbnail that's on the lower right hand corner and how you filled this atmosphere of tone Hello. in the upper left hand corner did you guys I'm sorry, can me? you repeat that for me? Oh, did I cut out? Sorry. So do you see the thumbnail in the lower right corner, Mandy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one, yes, I really feel like the atmosphere is intertwined with the flowers. And there's already a mm -hmm. haunting look to that. And so I would just say with all your thumbnails, try to think about that atmosphere and what you want that atmosphere to feel like, because sometimes atmosphere feels very free and open. Other times atmosphere can almost feel suffocating. And so thinking, what is the emotional response to the type of space that you want those flowers to occupy? Hmm. Okay. We'll do, I'll keep continuing working through that. I just, um, yeah, I, I'm so rusty with thumbnails. <laughs> Terrible. Okay. I should do more thumbnails more often. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that bottom left one, I think that was the most successful for me so far. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, yeah, the top left one, I feel like it was almost just chill. It was very, you know, it, it was isolated in its own different sense. Like mm -hmm. I had the flower at the top left part and you know, I thought, I thought that was kind of an interesting idea, mm -hmm. but I think I'm going to, I might do a few more of those, but I might, you know, it might trail away through my thumbnailing as I continue the process. Do so, you ever yeah. do thumbnails that are a variation on the theme? So sometimes I'll have a thumbnail and I'll say, well, I like this, but I need to tweak this one thing. And so sometimes the follow-up thumbnail is actually sort of similar to the one you just drew, but perhaps it does something a little bit different. So sometimes you have thumbnails that are all over the place, like they don't have any relationship at all. But other times you can make a variation on a theme. Okay. Um, uh, I may have tried that. I may not have realized it in the moment, you know, <laughs> as I'm, cause I'm trying to get as many of these done as possible, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, before, uh, but that's definitely a possibility. <laughs> cool. Um, Thanks, Nandy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mildred, hop on voice. So Mildred, if you're looking for the unmute, I'll send you a screenshot, but basically at the bottom, there should be an icon of a mic, and you want to make sure there is no slash through it. I'm going to post a screenshot. And another reminder, if anybody has any issues with tech, just let me know. And we also have Chrissy, who is a moderator here, and plenty of other folks that know Discord well. All right, so Mildred, if you can leave and come back, then we can get you on voice because that's what Chrissy ended up needing to do. Hello. Hey. Oh, yeah, it works. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to send a sample of what I was speaking about. Fantastic. So I have here um, Aache. Um, they are a deity of the Basque Pantheon, mm -hmm. and I was just playing around with different designs and concepts. Okay. The color image in the upper left, is that from the game? Oh, no, that's just something I found on Google to oh, okay. indicate who that was. 
Okay, so this is this is from a game or it is not? Um, this is a real tale deity god. Okay. So it's an existing god, but there is no game on it. Oh. It's not a game. No. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I need to make sure I have all the information <laughs> before we dive in. Okay, so you have the two versions here. And I like very much, Mildred, that you have all of these notes. I think that's really, really helpful. And it seems like you've spent quite a bit of time thinking about the clothing. Tell me about those shoes, the, I don't know how to say this, Abarca shoes. You want to tell me about those? Because I, I really like the way those are looking. Oh, yes. Um, in Euskadi, or Basque Country, um, these are some of the traditional footwear. Um, they put on little socks, and then um, they lace the shoes around them. They're beautiful. I love that. All right. What I would recommend you think about, because you've already got a very solid hold on the clothing and thinking about the symbolism with the vultures and the clouds and these armbands. And so in terms of clothing at this preliminary stage, you're doing a great job. I think that is really fantastic, the specificity. What I think would be worth thinking about more is the posture of the character in relation to their personality. Because right now, the two images of the character, he's standing very upright. And if you think about posture and how many different types of posture there's out there, it's really extraordinary what an impact that has on how we read a character. For example, if you think about a ballerina has amazing posture, I mean, that's the whole purpose of their profession. I saw a woman in Taiwan, she was elderly, and I've never seen somebody with such a hunched over posture in my life. I mean, she almost looked like she was bending onto the ground to pick something up. That was what her posture was like. So if we were to give this character a posture, how would you describe it based on who they are? Oh, is that a question right now? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay, no worries. Oh, um. So they're supposed to be very strong, very protective, so like a bottom-up view, and very strong and confident. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one thing you can think about there is how do the arms hang? Because in the image on the left, they are flexing their muscles. But I think what you can do is exaggerate things a lot more, because... I think when we try to draw a pose fairly accurately, it always ends up looking lukewarm in character design. It, it feels too ordinary in a way. So I would suggest when you design this character, try to exaggerate things more. Like let's say, for example, you want to show how muscular he is. So one option would be, okay, make the upper part of his body really big. Maybe the lower part of his body, which is less important, is very small. I mean, an example of that would be Mr. Incredible. He's a total exaggeration of that. I'll post a picture in case people don't know what I'm talking about. But do you think that's something you could play with, is some distortion, exaggeration? Yeah, I think that would benefit a lot. Because I think it's sometimes not so easy to do that because we worry that, oh, if I exaggerated too much, then nobody's going to be able to recognize what this is. But one thing that I think is very important in character design is if you really push things way too far, that's actually better than always underdoing it. Because the characters that I really love are the ones that are really over the top. And so I would just have no fear about pushing things so far that you feel like it's too much. Because sometimes you do it and then you're like, wow, actually that looks pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I hope that gives you a place to get going, Mildred. And maybe during the session, if you'd like to just do some quick gesture drawings, really, really simple drawings of the character, maybe leaving out some of the details of the boots and stuff, and show me his posture and his power as a character. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. Awesome. Thanks, Mildred. Thank you. All right. Let's scroll up and see where people are. This is fantastic. I just love seeing all these images. Crispy, hop on voice. Hello. Hey, Crispy. So you are working on some sculpture today. Yes, I'm working on some small polymer clay sculptures that I've been putting off. Oh my gosh. This is so wonderful. I don't know that I've seen a ton of 3D work from you. Yeah. Polymer clay work in the past, but I haven't really stuck with it as a medium. I do, the most that I've done is like polymer clay pins. Mm -hmm. And I actually posted those a while ago in the like introductory, like tomorrow or yesterday or the day before oh. of some polymer clay pins that are also fan art from the show. Oh. And they're just the little cat heads. So I was inspired by those and I wanted to finish these little cat sculptures that I've been working on. Great. I'm just pulling up some of the previous images that you have posted. And, oh, these. Whoa, wait a second. These are ones, these are the acrylic pins? Yeah, they're made from polymer clay, acrylic, and they're coated in resin. So they're very hard and like black almost uh -huh. but those are also being puppycat fan art mm -hmm. so it's all my idea is that all of it's going to be sort of like homogenous because the sculpture is going to be made out of the same materials and the same subject okay and now are these going to be done with the yeah. same technique because it looks like are you using colored pencil to do some of the lines uh, yes, I'm doing colored pencil to do some of the line art in some of the finer details because I just, I don't have small enough brushes and I think it would be a lot more efficient this way. You don't have any paint markers, do you? Uh, I have some. I have a couple uh, Posca markers, but mm -hmm. they're pretty broad tips, so I don't think they would be very good. Oh, okay. Well, you, you need small ones. Yeah. The reason I'm thinking that is yeah. I just love how expressive you've made the eyes. And I feel like if we had a drawing material that was more graphic, it would be easier to see them more clearly. So that could be something you put on the back burner for the future. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to mute real quick. Sure. Well, this is off to a great start, Crispy. And I love seeing all of your little sketches. like. A lot of people don't realize that actually when you do 3D art that you can sketch for 3D art. It, it seems like you can't because it seems to go so much against what the 3D object is. But actually some of my favorite drawings for 3D are by Henry Moore. So I'm gonna pull up some images because I actually- Okay, um, also, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, you go. Um, it's kind of hard to see in some of the photos that I posted because I didn't really showcase it. Mm -hmm. But I'm making two cat sculptures and only one of them I have a definitive reference. So I ended up sketching like a little template for what I want the other cat to look like in my sketchbook based off of a reference from the animation because there's not like a really good reference for the other cat. I sketched what I think it would look like in the same format from a video clip of the show. I see. So the sketchbook is really an integral part of this process? 
Uh, for the other one, yes, because I needed to make myself a reference that was in the same style and clarity of the other one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Yeah, I'm really well, excited. I can't wait to see what you do and keep posting updates. Yep. Yeah, thanks again. Thanks, Crispy. And again, everybody, don't feel any pressure to read the chat. You cannot look at it at all during this entire session, but I am dropping in some images of sculpture by Henry Moore and also his drawings where you can really see that, wow, you, you can sketch for a sculpture. Of course, there's a limit to what you can do, but it is pretty cool to see that process. Uh, Chrissy, hop on voice. Hello. Hey, all right. So it looks like you posted this image where you filled in the top three segments. Yeah, so far. Okay. Yeah, so far. That's what I've got done. Uh huh. Okay, so are the these first two are dated? more exercises the first or were, do you have a narrative you're yeah, trying to do? Um, it, what, I'm trying to do a composition. Uh, the basic subject is two people talking to each other uh, with some trees and some rocks in front and maybe a building in the distance. Okay. Um, and that's really all I'm trying to do is work on basic composition and tone. Okay. Um, that that's that's as far as I've gotten is just trying to work on basic composition here. Sure. In terms of composition, are you imagining that this would have a particular style? Because one thing that I really like is that you do have three different styles. The one in the middle feels a lot more calm. And then the one on the right actually looks a little foreboding. And then the one on the far left-hand side, it feels more bright in terms of mood, but it's also a very active drawing style. So I guess I'm asking, how much do you want your drawing style to influence your compositional choices? Well, um, it's more at this point, to be honest, a function of finding a drawing style, because these are just for thumbnails. Yep. Finding a drawing style that I can make a thumbnail fast enough that I don't get so frustrated that I quit after one thumbnail. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that's the, the, the plain and simple of it. The third one that I did, the one on the right, uh, that took me about 15, 20 minutes, I guess. Okay. Um, and it's, it's kind of getting toward where I want to. I think the scale of the building is awful. Mm -hmm. Um, but I like the way the lighting worked in it, that the sense of it's kind of moody and spooky and atmospheric. Yeah. Um, the one in the middle I did solely with select and fill. I did no, I mean, I did a, a quick original sketch and then the rest of it was just select and fill. Okay. Um, which takes longer than I thought it would. And the one on the right is more, that one I actually spent close to an hour on and I think that's closer to where I might go if I were doing actual pen work mm -hmm. toward a finished drawing instead of just a thumbnail. Sure. I guess I'm wondering what if we pull back and make the composition crazy simple, so simple that you could draw it in five minutes because in my opinion, one of the best ways to explore composition is with very, very simple shapes. Because here's the thing, your right drawing has a wonderful energy. I, I love the marks. And it's probably what's creating that really emotional moment, which is great for the narrative. But as far as composition goes, it's tougher to read because you have all of these wonderful strokes. And so I'm thinking, what if you try one where it's just so simple that the people don't even have heads? They're, they're just a, a little thing in the middle. Does that appeal or do you want to keep doing thumbnails that take longer to make? Um, 
I'm going to try that next. Okay. What you just said, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so let me delete what I had done, and mm -hmm. I will try what you suggested next. Because, yeah, I want to yep. – this – all I'm trying to get to is so that I can – there's a saying about thumbnails that the purpose of thumbnails is to make your big mistakes fast. Yep. I want to be able to make my big mistakes fast. I don't mm -hmm. want to spend – 40 minutes and discover, as I did, for example, on the one on the left, that I put the tree right behind the, the other person, and so you can't even really read that person at all. Right. Um, so that that's one of those mistakes that I should have I should have caught five minutes in and would have if I were working in a way that was going to reveal the tonal pattern sooner. Does that make I sense? See. Yeah, totally makes sense. You might try this. I actually just went through this myself because one of the things I really like about your thumbnails is those beautiful cast shadows that the two figures are making. And what I did recently with my art director exercise is I made this page of just crazy simple thumbnails. I mean, I think each one took me about a minute to make. So I just sketched one really, really fast. And I'm going to post that in the chat to show you what that might look like. Because I think that would be fun to do. Okay, let me scroll down, waiting to see. Give me a second. Because I, it, I learned such a lesson there where I just was too reliant on the articulation of things because I was getting really involved. And, and really, I should have just looked at, okay, fundamentals. All right, I will tag you on yes, that as well. Yes, that. That's what I'm looking for. That kind of basic simplicity that gives a sense of depth and composition without screwing around, basically. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. I'm, I'm going to put in the chat. These are ones, Christy, I did in marker. And sometimes having, well, for you, it would be a big brush on your program. But I found that was also very helpful because I get too stuck on the other things otherwise. Yeah, one of the interesting things I've discovered since I got my sketchbook and started sketching traditionally mm -hmm. is that I am way looser when I'm using a ballpoint pen in my sketchbook than I am when I'm working digitally. Oh, you are. I just, yeah, because whatever, I, I can't erase it anyway, so just keep scribbling until something starts to look decent. Yeah. Um, whereas I, I, I'm i trying to get there digitally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to that same looseness, ridiculousness that, that I have when I sketch. Let me see if I can find one of the sketches that I, seems live sketching that I did and I'll post it. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, Chrissy. And I'll take a look at that once it's posted. All right. Thank you. Cool. Okay. I'm scrolling up and seeing all kinds of really cool pieces. Uh, Neil, do you want to hop on voice? Hey, how's Hello. it going? It's good. Wow. This is really intense. Neil, tell me about this image. Well, the funny thing about this image is, like, I don't really know what it's about anymore. So, this is uh, an old thumbnail that I resurrected. I originally drew the thumbnail, like, last year. And mm -hmm. what inspired this initially was, I saw this, like, woman on TikTok, and she talked about, like, how she had to give up her addiction because of her child. And that that was such a powerful story, and it stuck to me. So I thought maybe I would make something in response to that. So that was the first concept when I made the thumbnails. Mm -hmm. But when I started painting, I thought the colors kind of remind me reminded me of the Palestinian flag, and so maybe there's a correlation between what mothers in that area are experiencing. So when I was first coloring it that sort of became the meaning. But now that I'm looking back at it, like I don't know anymore what this is about. So mm -hmm. I just wanna I just wanna finish it. So mm -hmm. maybe that's not a problem, but 
I don't know. I've always bothered myself about, ooh, what does it mean? <laughs> that sometimes, <laughs> yeah, some, sometimes it's a, it's a good thing that I'm thinking about, like, what am I talking about? But other times, I feel like it becomes more of a distraction than it's yeah. a good thing. So, yeah, what do you think? <laughs> I think it's okay to start a piece and say, I'm not going to think about concept at all. I'm just going to work on lighting. Or I'm just going to think about a dynamic figure. That's totally fine. I think that every artwork we make serves a different purpose. Because sometimes I just really don't want to think about the concept. I want to focus on other things. So that's always okay. And I do think, Neil, it's actually fairly common for us to have the image that we want to make before we even know what it's about. And I definitely have had projects like that where I have an image and I'm really sustained by it, but I don't know why I'm making those images. And that's fine to have something be a little ambiguous as you're working on. Does that sound a little appealing? That definitely makes sense. <laughs> so for this piece, I think moving forward, what I'd like to change about it is I'm sort of really bothered by the hand. I'm okay. still figuring out the anatomy of that. And also, I think I want to add more space between the broken window and have some maybe stronger wind blowing her hair okay. so that there will be more motion in the hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you think? All right, let's start with the hand. I think the issue with the hands, I think it's the thumb actually, because you're drawing the thumb almost like it's another one of the other fingers, except it's lower. But if you look at your hand, the thumb almost has this upside down triangle. I'm gonna take a picture and draw this for you, but it's like you're missing a whole part of the hand. And you have to look at the thumb as being in this totally different universe than the other fingers. So I'm going to draw this for you quickly. And then I would also say the pointer finger and the middle finger, there's something odd about the width of those fingers at the bottom. I think they just get too wide. Like they almost look like a monument that gets thinner at the top. I think you probably don't want the width to change that much from the bottom to the top of the finger. All right, I'm gonna upload for you, Neil, this picture of my hand, and I just drew this little rectangle, I mean triangle, I don't know my shapes. So that way you can take a look at it. Do you see the picture of my hand, Neil? Neil, I think you're muted. Okay. <laughs> oh, there you are. Yeah, I understand. Okay. I forgot about that part of the head. Yeah. Okay. That's what you're missing. And then were you asking about the opening? The part where the wood is yeah. missing? I think I will add more space. Should I add more space so that make the opening wider or not? I would. Actually, this goes back to what Lisa and I were talking about in terms of negative space. I mean, it'd be interesting for you to take a version of this and wipe out almost all of the wood. Just leave a tiny little bit of it. I'm not saying that's what you should do. I'm just saying as an experiment to see how much negative space you can do. Because I do feel like on the left-hand side, it looks a lot like you're trying to almost put the wood around her, but have it not touch her. It's almost like this little glow of negative space around her. So I sort of feel like on the left-hand side, I'm craving for you to remove more of the wood. Right-hand side, not as much. I feel like maybe that could be the balance, that the left-hand side has not so much wood, and the one on the right actually does have a lot of it still intact. Oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> Try some digital versions. I, I think what really helps me is to just look at those options and put them side by side. 
And oftentimes it's pretty clear which one you like more. Yeah. Thanks. I'll do that. Great. Lovely to see this stuff, Neil. Thank you. Cool. Scrolling up to see what people are doing. How about we take a look at uh, um, Trinasia? Can you hop on voice and let's take a look at your piece? You're asking about gold paint. Hello. Hey, so I feel like I saw, maybe did I see this piece during the workshop? I remember the peacock feathers. Yes, you did. I hadn't quite started coloring it yet. Cool. All right. And what is the media you're using for the color? It is mostly colored pencil right now. Okay. And I was just thinking about the gold for the... It's like, it's supposed to be kind of gold in the picture. So mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to make it more like poppy, I guess. Sure. I am so captivated by those blue spheres that are to the left and right side of her face. Those have such a bulbous look to them. And it's such a good contrast because there are other parts like the clothing on the top part of the torso is very much lines. There's no shading or anything in there. But I like those moments where it seems like there is a little bit of shading. And I'm wondering if maybe that's something we can put in more places because then we have more of a relationship. So some parts are, are really, really flat, like the yellows, and then other parts that have a little bit more form, like those blue spheres. What do you think? Yes, definitely. I think I'm trying to do that a little more with um, kind of the the cage to the left. And also um, I'm working on the feathers mm -hmm. on her headpiece. And I feel like for the most part, um, I definitely wanted to have um, a little bit more form. I'm wondering about the peacock leaves. Do you want those to be really clean clear cut lines or would you be open to maybe adding a little texture with the colored pencil? Oh, I'll send a picture. I actually started them. Um, oh, you did? Okay. Awesome. And I'm trying to get them more textured just by layering some green on top of each other. Okay. Let me see. I'm just drawing some examples for you here, but one thing that I think is very helpful with colored pencil, especially when you're trying to do texture is to think about physical pressure. How hard are you pressing? Because in a peacock feather, there are some parts that are like really, really soft. And there's other parts that are a lot darker. So usually Trinasia, when you are drawing with colored pencils, do you vary the physical pressure or is it more even? Um, I do vary. Um, I feel like right now I'm a little more soft because um, I don't want to like erase it, even though you kind of can. It like leaves that mark. So I try to be kind of careful. Right. If you start light and then incrementally build to bolder pressure, that can usually prevent getting in parts that you just want to get rid of. So do you ever start the colored pencil really light and then build it up? Or do you go right into the full out saturation? Um, I feel like a lot of the time I do um, kind of press down harder. I do try to be conscious about it. Um, but yeah, most of the time I think I like go right in there okay i just okay, yeah, posted I like in the chat so varying physical pressure with the colored pencil so you can see 
in this image, I have a couple spots like on the left hand side here, it's barely there. And then in the middle, like say in the stem, I'm pressing really hard. So maybe Trinesia, one thing you can work on is expanding that range of physical pressure. Try some areas where you press harder than you normally do. Try some areas where it's crazy light, way lighter than you would ever think to do, because that would give you more range with the colored pencil. Okay, yeah, I really like the way that's looking. Definitely try that out. I like the shape too. I was trying, I was kind of struggling with how to capture that shape. Well, that's your shape. <laughs> I just lifted it from you. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I just want to fan it out more like that. So, but yeah, I like that. And the other thing about colored pencils too is that they do layer very beautifully. So, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to layer very light blue. So, I'm not going to press that hard. But I think that's where colored pencil gets really exciting, which is when you start to show those layers as opposed to the shapes. Yes. I mean, the shapes are very important. I would not get rid of the shapes because if you did, everything would look all weird and fluffy. And so you can think about those shapes as being really solid columns for your piece to fall upon. And then that leaves space for the, the fuzzy light stuff in the feathers. Okay. Makes sense. All right. I'm going to put in that version again. So and um, see. I also had an, a question about um, like her dress because sure. I think I want to keep it white, like mm -hmm. where it's white for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. But I do want to um, kind of have that depth with it. Like it's kind of silky. I see. So do you have any suggestions on how I could do that? So are you talking about the bottom of the dress or more towards her hip? Um, like the bottom and I'm kind of debating on the top part. I think I want to leave it white. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You could do what you're doing with those blue spheres where you make the inside of the dress a lighter color. Well, I mean, you could leave it white, actually. And then maybe the sides of the dress, you do a light gray. So you're not losing the white color of the dress, but you're giving it a hair of variation in color. So it's not just all the white of the page. Okay. The key to Sounds a lot of good, these things is variation. So for example, I just posted this image. So I put blue over the flower, the not flower, the feather. And do you see how immediately, just because there's a second color, it's number one more interesting, but also it looks more volumetric. And so I did see earlier and I'm so happy to see the way you're doing those leaves. I mean, it's exactly what we're talking about. But let's say you put a dark brown or a dark maroon would be really, really nice in a couple select places. And that will make the green more varied. Okay. Yeah, I really like the that kind of blue behind it. That's really pretty. Yeah. Um, okay. Awesome. Well, I will consider that then. Thank I'm you. I'm excited to see what you do with that. All right. Thank you very much. Of course. And Mimsy, or is it Mimsy? Yeah. Mimsy, I'm just going to just type to you because um, I wasn't sure if you wanted to speak on voice. Let me know if you want uh, to. Hi. Oh, I think okay. voice would be better. Can you hear me? Yeah, of course. Yeah, voice is always more efficient. Oh, yeah. Only because I'm only because yeah, efficient and I'm driving. So oh, okay, be yeah. careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All good, all good. Sorry, it was a last minute change in the schedule, and then anyway, so I'm nice. here. I'm listening in. I'm not quite working, but I'm working in my head. I guess you know. Like, you know something? I was a little what you just at first, said? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. About working in your head. 
that is not mm-hmm. a small thing. That That is a real thing working in your head. And Blue Wolf, who is a moderator here, she told me she hasn't had a lot of time to put into the actual drawing, but she said she's been thinking about things a lot. And when she sat down, it's like it all came out of her. So it's extremely valuable. Yeah, I think I do too much of that (laughs) and not enough sitting down and and, um, creating real studio time, you know, clocking in because that's valuable too. And like the, the thinking about things and living life, which is, you know, that's where a lot of the inspiration of stuff comes from too. It's like, I don't know. So that's, that's what, um, yeah, that's when I also kind of like, at first I was like really annoyed that the schedule got thrown off and like, do I communicate, but it's too last minute, but yeah. can't change it. And I just didn't want to complicate things, but I just sat with it and just am being with whatever life throws at me because yep. that's what life is. <laughs> And all you can do. Doing. And I'm just kind of like, yeah. And so I'm just being present to that and seeing how that affects like my actual workflow, which is like, you know, what are the the the, the sort of challenges I need to really like work with and work through, you know, in order to create more studio time. Right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, so that's just uh, you know, I do appreciate this. Uh, I'm also like curious because it's like I know you had a sort of uh, you know what 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 the open studios is as yeah. opposed to the workshops and as opposed to the patreon calls i'm not a patreon um member so i don't know what that's like right um and i just kind of listen in on whatever recordings you have when i can you know and and they're very helpful it's such a wonderful community and i'll, I'll pipe in chats here and there so awesome. I'm, I'm like not 100 percent always there because I'm dealing with so much other stuff and and there is that part of me that really wants to be you know mm-hmm. part of this like oh I this is my you know like who, 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 who do I share my work with in a an environment that could you know nurture them okay. yeah so you might and, like the patreon voice sessions because the biggest difference is that we don't work during the patreon voice sessions I mean you can I'm not gonna stop you. Oh. But the emphasis yeah, yeah. is people really focusing on the conversation. This is different because Got you it. can get feedback from me in real time. So Trinesia was just oh, oh, working yeah. on those feathers, and I can jump in there right in the moment and help with the feathers. But in the Patreon group, we don't do the working. We just talk about a million different things, and they're really wonderful conversations. We have a lot of people who, for some reason or another, maybe they're at work, but love listening in. So I, I think it's all valuable. Yeah. It's just exercising different muscles. True. Yeah, so I think the next session I have with you, I'll make sure that nothing is happening on that day. Oh, no worries. Like, I mean, you know, I mean, and because I do want to experience it for what it is, because it's such a, you know, it is, a, I, you know, I get the idea of, you know, sharing our work and what we're working on in real time in a community. Yeah. And that is... Uh, you know, also very cool. And across time zones too, I think this, you know, this particular way of doing it online as opposed to a face-to-face open studio is also right. really kind of cool. Also, so I just, yeah. I mean, it blows my mind but, oh. that we have people in multiple time zones. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. I've never been able to talk, teach such a diverse group of people. It's incredible. Oh, I do have a question, though, because okay. I do have, um, I don't know, anyone can, in the chat, I'll read the chat stuff later, but has anyone really uh, worked with, like, water-soluble crayons? Because I just was gifted one set of beautiful, you know, 84 color, whatever, uh-huh. set of these amazing, you know, water-soluble crayons. And they are, because, like, I work with a limited palette, usually. Uh-huh. And so, like, suddenly I'm like, oh, this <laughs> <laughs> colors. I'm just like, what do I do with all this? And it's it's exciting and intimidating at the same time. Like, yeah. I'm scared to eat. I have a little bit of materials anxiety at first. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, just looking at the crayons, smelling them, <laughs> not really working with them. And then, then I was like, okay, finally, I just worked with them because they're meant to be used. And and then it's like, wow, you know, like this whole yeah. world just opened up. But I don't know what to do with all these colors and stuff. And, and so I guess, you know, I think I'll spend my whole life just like, you know, spending each time with each color, I guess. And, you know, and, and the relationship because there's the color 
itself. And then there's the colors and how they relate to one another. And yeah. And then I don't know. Then I went into overdrive with like my brain just went like cat paddle. <laughs> so it's overload. overwhelming. But it's so many things. But, yeah, but it's. Uh, I'm thinking. Oh, maybe I should do the color track, and maybe I, you know, that that also just kind of opened up this whole like other thing of you know, but but it is wonderful in the sense that I mean, so far from the limited stuff I've done with it, it's uh-huh. it's um, you know, it's drawing with ink, I guess, you know, like directly, like with drawing, I tend to just stick to a pencil or pen, mm-hmm. like just a single medium, but n- with all these colors now, I'm just like, whoa. I mean, watercolor pencils were one thing, but yeah. the crayons have a different, yeah, I don't know, but I'm just curious to know if anyone's worked with them and what they found, you know, I don't know, with it, and then there's this whole idea of resisting the wax crayons yeah. too, and yeah, anyway, so I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> Can you tell me what brand do you have? Um, it was Karen Dash. Karen okay, Cara, uh, right. It's a Swiss brand, yeah. Those are the good ones. <laughs> Neo Color 2. Yeah, the good ones, yeah. So, yes. like, rich colors that are highly pigmented. And I mean, yeah, I mean, this stuff wasn't was not... You know, it was just a beautiful set. It is a beautiful set, which is why the <laughs> intimidation. <laughs> I mean, those are my favorite crayons. I think they're extraordinary. And I will tell you, you don't have to worry about burning through them. They last forever. And Yay. probably <laughs> will go through a touch faster because you're using water. But I have sets from years ago, and I'm not even mm-hmm. close to finishing them. So they last a very long time. And I think part of the the fear of a new material that feels too good for you, I do that with watercolor mm-hmm. paper. I'm like, you're too good for me. I can never paint on you. <laughs> Is yeah. to just dig into it. Now, this image of the floating figure, is this the same crayon? Yep, that is. And then that was actually, I had some good paper like that. I had like uh, I had a, bought a roll of um, like the artist like cold press stuff for like a project, and yes. then I, I had some extras that I just forgot about, and then I unrolled you know I was clearing out things, and then I was like oh I saw a paper, so I cut it down and just made like a little notebook out of the paper, mm-hmm. and then I have one huge one. I think these colors need more space because like a little little pad of paper I, I mean the little like makeshift notebook that I made from the the leftover paper is kind of mm-hmm. small um, and then but I did keep like a large piece to just you know have fun with and because it's old paper even mm-hmm. though it's good paper it doesn't feel as precious so it's like okay let's just <laughs> use it because it's there you know <laughs> so that oh was a, I get <laughs> Yeah, but like, I mean, and you know, this is the good, I mean, I just also want to share with like really good art materials, you know, you spend a lot on them, but like this was in storage for maybe 10 years. Oh, I believe. Over 10 years. I have supplies. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, I mean, they were well kept, but it was still like, (laughs) you know, just there. Just haven't (laughs) seen the light of day for over a decade, right? Yeah. But yeah, so I feel very, you know, uh, like ready. It's like, okay, what's stopping you now? You have everything. <laughs> I <laughs> think an excuse in my head, like, oh, I've got this. Oh, I don't have the paper. I don't have, oh, my oil paints are low. I can't let, you know, whatever, right? That 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 sort of narrative. And then it's like, okay, look, you've got everything. You've got these huge, you have too much, actually, <laughs> of these colors. And then there's the paper and, you know, so stop complaining and just work, you know, that's kind of like where, where it is. So it's, it's that. So. I was going to tell you, I love yes. the yes. dreamy atmospheric quality in the drawing of the woman. It, it seems like mm-hmm. you really do well with bleeds and creating these very soft atmospheric spaces, but you also have given the face enough structure that it doesn't look like the face melted or anything like that. And so that's a really nice combination of the concrete form of the face, but then the very loose flow of strokes that are around her. So I think already you're achieving quite a bit of atmosphere in this piece. Well, I actually think those might be studies for bigger work. Um, They're kind of like my version of a 
thumb, well, it's not quite a thumbnail, it's a bigger thumbnail, I guess. <laughs> um, and I do want to make a, a whole bunch of, like, I don't know, this, this idea of floating and being mm -hmm. in water. Um, that sort of theme is sort of very appealing. Um, and I kind of want to explore that more. So I think I'll work on more of the, that sort of solid liquid, I don't know, something about that right. dual states of, yeah, weightlessness and gravity. I don't know. There's that. <laughs> My child is late. <laughs> Which uh -huh. is so uh -huh. lucky. I'm going to send you Sorry. in the chat, Mimsy. I don't know if you've seen this painting, okay. but it's by John Everett Millay. And it's one of the most famous pre raphaelite Oh, is this the Ophelia drama? Ophelia, one? yep. It, it's a... Yes. Oh, yes. I love that. It's a really good reference. But the other thing I was going to say, in mm -hmm. terms of your crayon technique, one thing, and it's very similar to what I was talking to Trinasia about, which is the physical <laughs> pressure. And it's surprising with the crayons... Ah. Number one, how many layers you have to do. And number two, that you do have to press pretty hard. And that's why sometimes they're not always great for certain people because sometimes that physical exertion is a little bit too much. But because you're using them with water, what you can do is press down harder than you typically would. But then what you'll find is there'll be more crayon on the paper, which gives you more opportunity. Because I know this piece is obviously not finished yet, but I can see that your crayon layer is still pretty thin. And if you triple mm -hmm. that crayon layer and press harder, you'll find that the painting part, you've got much more to work with. Ah, okay, good, good. I actually felt like that the, the colors are so intense because I, I think with watercolor too, it tends to work really lightly. Oh, really? <laughs> so the uh, hunch, yeah. So this was already like, whoa, so much color. <laughs> But, but yeah, I, I'll try that. You know, I think it's it's like, yeah, I mean, the layering aspect of it sounds very appealing, too. It's super fun. Well, I'm so glad we got to chat, Mimsy. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for yes. inviting me to this space. Yeah, I, I love it here. I mean, you guys are my treat <laughs> for all the spreadsheets. I'm like, oh, now I can just kick back and have fun with you guys. It's great. Okay. okay, how do I mute? Okay, I'll mute now so you okay. can move on. <laughs> Thanks, Mimsy. All right, uh, Blue Wren, do you want to hop on voice? I saw some beats back here. Oh, wow. Hello. All right. Hello. Can yeah, you? I'm here. Can mm -hmm. you hear me? Oh, cool. My computer's doing strange things. Um, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah, the beats. <laughs> I actually, there's another piece further down that I finished yesterday. Oh, I see. Yep. That um, yeah, so the beads, I'm just mucking around with the inks and what happens if I layer them this way and do this and that the other way and I just really um, playing with texture. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I've got more work to do. I mean, I could lead at the beads, you know what I mean, but I'm looking for, yeah, just uh -huh. how can I get textures in different ways and include transparency more and all that kind of stuff. Um, but this other work, I did, I finished it yesterday. Oh. And um, there's one thing, kiddies, that we all need to know, that when you're experimenting with a new medium, it's really important to do a really, really complex form in uh -huh. three-point perspective <laughs> with mad shadows. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Just giving people okay, space cool. to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was a bit dumb. Um, and it's actually a photo I took myself. I don't know if you've been to Barcelona and you've been to um, the Gaudi house, La Pedrera. I haven't. I want to go though. Oh, okay. Well, this is on the roof. It oh. has all these centurions. Wow. Um, and the doorway in the thing, that's where you come up through. From, from so you've been there. The Sorry? You've been there. Yeah, that's my, that's my photograph. Oh, that's your photograph. Okay, I see. Oh, cool. Yeah, so that's the first photograph, and then the second one is just the work. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know. I don't even know what I want to talk about. I did I do okay? It, uh, it sort of feels a bit overworked, um, yeah. particularly the head on the far right, which kind 
I developed a lean. So it looks like it's photo bombing. But we'll just say I purposely distorted the three uh-huh. point perspective. Um, and also, the, the paper was not my friend. Really? Um, with this work, I have to say that. Um, and uh, I don't know. I tried to maintain the transparency as long as I could, and I tried to put in some textural marks. And uh-huh. um, I like the shadow over the door that's been cast by that first head. I think that was quite uh-huh. successful. Well, that one is and... so bold and simple that it's a good contrast against some of those more textured marks you're putting in there. Yeah. I think maybe, well, first of all, are you going to work on this one some more? No, it's just, a, again, it was just another study using okay. the ink. So okay. I'll, I'll tell you why I kind of chose it. Um, I had this idea that I think I could really get my teeth into. So I was just looking through these old travel photos for things to draw because I thought I've got lots of fabulous photographs, you know. Uh-huh. Um, which are already composed, I compose them so I can, you know, use them uh, to do these explorations. And then um, I was thinking about it because I've travelled with my sister, but I've also travelled to Barcelona with my husband as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I was thinking about, um, you know how um, back in the day Native tribes thought when they saw photographs of themselves that their souls had been captured. Right. And then I thought about... Then I thought about the opposite. What if when we take a photograph in these places, oh. um, part of our soul is trapped there? Mm-hmm. And then I <laughs> and then I started thinking about it. And then I tripped over these photos that I actually took in La Pedrera when I was mm-hmm. with my husband Terry. And they're photographs of a dollhouse, which has like a glass or perspex in front of it. I can't remember. Cool. And there's all these weird reflections in it, Ooh. which don't kind of, they're almost like ghost images, but they're, they're, it's not like the whole body. It's like sections of things are in there. And I thought, oh, my God, I've already photographed this concept. But, that is so cool. You know, I've done. Um, and sort of, I'm sort of thinking, and then because of inks have the transparency, I'm mm. sort of thinking, well, how can I how can I do that? How can I overlay these transparent images without them not actually being there? So that's what I'm exploring with the ink. Mm-hmm. Um, but not necessarily in this particular picture. I was um, going to tell you, and I reckon- Blue, the beat, I, I feel like they are alive. <laughs> They're bubbling and... There's something about the way you're applying the wash that makes these feel like creatures more than produce. And I wonder if it's the variation in the middle and bottom and how that almost has this, I don't know, gutsy, visceral feel. But then you have that really simple red blob at the bottom and, of course, the bleed with the white. But... I, I really enjoy just how fleshy you've made the beats look. Okay, which one, which picture are you looking at? Are you looking at the one that says best of the bunch or the one, the group one? The one that's on a single image. That, I mean, they all have yeah, that yeah. quality, but that one in particular, I think it's because of that highlight that you have in the middle that really oh, yeah. articulates the form better than the other ones. Yeah, yeah, the other ones were really early on that I posted that in. So I'd, I'd actually did a bit more work on those. Yeah. Um, but this one here, so what I did was, and, and look, honestly, I haven't really done much. I could have helped myself more by defining the form, but I was just sort of laying down a blob and seeing what I could do. <laughs> um, so what I did with this one was I laid down a big puddle of water and then I just applied the ink around the periphery um, in that sort of, um, what is it, it's a natural red, uh-huh. um, and then drew the other bits over it. So, yeah, because it's this, I wanted to capture this light coming in on the image. It looks like those little bits around the, mm-hmm. around the sections are almost glowing, and I'm thinking, how do you capture that? How do you? Is... Uh, I mean, I know you could put in just a flat thin wash, just yellow red, and then you could very carefully right. drop in 
I'm kind of more interested in, as you say, seeing where the, the liveliness can come from. Now, is that a white acrylic ink that's at the very bottom? It is. Well, no, it's not. It's got a little bit of the natural red mood mixed through it. And mm -hmm. what I've done is um, for most of it, I'm sort of drawing it on with a fairly fine brush and then trying to feather out the edge really quickly with a mm -hmm. bit of water. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really hard because it dries so fast. And I said, why don't I have two brushes, you doit? You know, like, <laughs> just two brushes. Because <laughs> I was just quickly trying to rinse it and dry it enough. And if I have enough water, you're an idiot. It's really cool because you have the white, which is the white of the page near that bleed. Yeah. And so that's a very, I mean, I'm being sort of exaggerated here, but it's almost like a yellowish white. And then I look at yeah. the white glaze and that has almost a lavender feel to it, but it doesn't feel like lavender. It really feels like a white that's over the red. And I, I just love that comparison between those two whites. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm gonna. I also think again that was, I was using that other paper, which is not my friend, so I've gone to something <laughs> a little bit smoother. Cool. Um, yeah. So, um, any words about that other work? Because the like the okay, here in, scroll but, yeah. back and take a look at that. Okay, I guess if you did work on it more, probably what it would benefit from is you see those sort of like turquoise green tones that you have now those are very effective yeah. in the shadow area yeah i feel like that yeah. is really well done i think maybe what you need to do so it, in the middle there's these two tips in the middle and they have some green and turquoise to help articulate the form but i think mm -hmm. maybe you need to do a more simple glaze first of just light, light turquoise and paint over the whole shape or the whole shadow or something. Because I suspect yeah, that's so why I like the shadows so much is that they're simple, they cover a big area. Whereas at the top of the building, the green strokes, they look like they're, they're just sort of um, painted on. I don't feel like they're actually part of the form the way it does in the shadows. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, that was a problem because they went on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I initially was trying to do it all in like transparent glazes. Uh -huh. um, but what happened with the faces was that it was all just merging into a block. Like they didn't even make sense as geometric uh -huh. shapes. So that was added on top. And by that stage, there'd be so much ink on it. It's almost like trying to put a wash over acrylic paint. Uh -huh. um, and so that's why you know, they look like that. Whereas uh, um, those those blaze bits that come down the building, they are actually about ten washes of really thin mm. layers. Mm -hmm. And um, I've kind of got a, that sort of sandstone colour, and then it was like a um, like a dark teal, but cause, yeah, laid on really really thinly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. I just posted for you, this is a printmaker who used to be in this organization. I was in print, Boston Printmakers, and this is Sydney Hurwitz. And I think wow. she's a really good example of how you can put a, a big glaze that's like really simple shape over something. So mm. if you look at this piece, mm. most of it is that mm. light reddish brick wall. But if you see yeah, that yeah. shadow at the very bottom... I'm thinking something like that, yeah. which is really, really simple. So we get the shapes before we start breaking down all the textures. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Cool. Yeah. So what did I do? I'm just trying to think back what I, what I actually did. Oh, yeah. Okay. So here's what happened. I was laying in those bloody shadows and I was why is this looking so weird? And it was way back in the thing. And then I realized I hadn't done the lighter shadow cross that falls across the whole wall. So you, you're spot on. Uh -huh. You're spot on. And then I, but then I think that it was towards the end I was afraid of laying it in too dark. But maybe I should have done just another couple of passes. I mean, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Awesome. <laughs> so maybe well, I have to lay it yeah. looking forward to it. Mm. Cool. Thanks, Marta. Right. Thanks, see ya. Okay.
I want to make sure I get to everybody before I start going back to other people. So how about Wartink? Let me know what's happening. And okay, if you don't want to speak on voice at this very minute, but I do want to make sure I get to you and also Sarah before we end the session, which will be in, gosh, time flies, 35 minutes. <laughs> it's like I Hello. Blink. Hey, how's it going? What are you thinking today? So I just finished, I mean, I you saw the beginning post um, and that's where I just posted what I just finished. So I did, I finished the hair and the, well, not finished, I blocked in the, the right. hair and the face today. So the canvas is covered at least. Awesome. Uh, um, but there's a billion things wrong with the face I need to come in and correct. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I'm pretty burnt out for now. So <laughs> but like, you know, the, the edges around the lips are all wrong. The chin doesn't, tape is needs to be tweaked. Uh -huh. The left, the, well, stage right, my left mm -hmm. uh, lens on the glass, tape is wrong, needs to, before shortened the bed, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of little detail things. You need to throw some like strands of hair over the skin to give it that sense of depth and right. a lot of little corrections, but not too bad, especially since uh, I've never been great with portraits and mm -hmm. it's been a while. So do you feel like but portraits is an about it. area you want to target more? I know you've been doing all this super cool plain air on site work, but is portraiture something that you do want to improve on? Um, yes, actually. Um, so, well, yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's the short, long yeah. short of it. Um, the, yeah, I mean, frankly, the plein air stuff is more about socializing. Yeah. Um, my wife travels for work a lot. And oh. so, um, when she's gone, I try to go out and see humans. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's yeah, that's when I'll... <laughs> Yeah, so there's a lot of sketching groups in Singapore, so I just try to, you know, walk, go to as many of them as I can when she's away. That's so cool. And so that's why I'm getting a, a good pile of, uh, of uh, plenty of things. I guess my question for you, as you work on this painting, how far do you think you'd be willing to depart from the colors of the original reference, or, or do you want to stay fairly close? Um, I have no specific vision to push too far away from okay. it. Um, okay. um, yeah. <laughs> One thing I would consider, but, like, but... the reason I'm asking that is because what's a little tricky about the photo is that the background, that tannish yellow ochre, it's really similar to the face color. And at least right now, I think that they're almost verging on going into each other. Like I think especially the neck feels really similar to that background. So it could mm. be, I mean, you can pick whichever one you want, but let's just say you tint that landscape just a hair more green. So it can separate more from the face because I'm finding as I look at the piece, that's the, the most fundamental thing I see. I mean, yes, there's things you can fix and everything with the details, but that is a place where I think departing from the photo color wise would help you. No, that's a good note. I'm completely fine with like tweaking the background. Um, yeah. yeah, I've already tweaked it once actually because it was a little too dark. And so the the shadow edges around the like neck and skirt and the hair weren't yeah. popping enough. Um, so it's still kind of like messy. It's not. Of course. But it'd be easy, pretty easy to come in with some green and, and give it a little more. I mean, yeah, I mean, even the plants from the reference have been kind of washed out yeah. from that. So, I mean, so adding a, a glaze, you don't even need to add more green. Just a slight tint would be enough. And then the other part I think I would look at where, again, <laughs> you probably need to depart from the reference photo is the horizon line, because this happens a lot. You've probably notice in plein air painting that sometimes that horizon line really looks crisp and it is very blunt. But I find that it, it's sort of rare that you can have a horizon line in a painting that is super crisp and blunt without things getting really flat. And so you might cheat a little bit in that transition 
So that way, maybe the edge is a little bit less defined, maybe a little smearier. It might help push that landscape further back. Okay, I mean, I have a little bit of, I did put a little transition line to fuzz it up a bit, but maybe mm -hmm. it's not sufficient. It needs to be a little more, a little more uh, fuzzy. I mean, you could even think about, in either way, you could put some new strokes in there where the yellow sort of pushes into the blue. So yes, you can certainly go in and blend, but one of the things I really like about this piece is your brushwork. I think especially in the landscape has this wonderful texture. And so maybe we use some of that to change the transition between the sky and the bottom. Yeah, I mean, the the background bit's already dry, so I can't really do oh, it okay, for that. <laughs> Um But um, yeah, I mean, I actually generally don't blend as a matter of course. Um, it's pretty rare that I'll blend something. Oh, really? Um, and there's, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. One of the first things, well, one of the recommendations, I guess, um, when I was learning was like, yeah, don't blend. Uh -huh. Just put the blotches in, and they'll they'll blend a little bit on the edges as they do, but don't come uh -huh. in with a, you know, a fine brush and like, you know, feather everything out and hide all the brushiness. Mm -hmm. But, um. And actually, I mean, I generally like the effect of the brushiness. Right. Um, like, I mean, in this one, the good example are the buttons on the hat. Oh, I love the buttons on the because, hat. Because, yeah, because you zoom in on it and it's nothing. It's just a weird smudge. Right. It doesn't look like anything. <laughs> and then and then you pull out and it just works, right? And so I, that's what I kind of love about this kind of style. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where you get a close and it's just a bunch of junk and you get back <laughs> and then somehow it comes together. Well, it's a good example that everything we do in a painting is all about context. Because some of these things, if we took them out of their context, they would look like nothing. But the way that you've set the ground for those buttons to exist within is really important. And I do see something, not to the point that you did with the buttons, but I also see in the collar that there is a looseness in there. And I think it's, I think you do have a couple dots. Yeah, like there's this, oh, I love this mark. <laughs> this is a really tasty mark. This one, um, I'll circle it for you. It's on the far right and it's right at the collar and it almost looks like a fish if you look at it by itself. But that's another mark that doesn't make sense without that context. Oh, so the one that's kind of in the middle of the dark bit? Yeah, yeah, that one. So you see how it looks yeah. a little fish-like? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right, thanks, Bartink. Sure, thank you. All right, I want to make sure that I get to chat with... Oh, I believe... Sa oh, shoot, I should have talked to Sarah before. Crap. Yeah, if any of you need to leave, let me know. I feel really bad now that I blanked from that. Let me scroll all the way down. Oh my gosh, there's so much happening here and I'm missing out. Oh, okay, so Sarah left me. All right, I'll just reply to that. So sorry, I didn't get to you. Feel free to tag me here if you have any questions. I'm just gonna scroll up and see. Oh, Amanda, let's talk about your most recent thumbnail. I do really like the verticality. Hey. Hello. Hey. So, right, where yeah, are I just, we? I, I, I was exploring, and I just decided to flip everything upside down. I was like, oh, this is really cool. I haven't seen anything like this before, and it's not a cliche. I hope not. No. Anyway. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. I think that yeah, is and it, beautiful, Amanda. Right. Uh, but thank you. Uh, I, I think it, it works with the theme and the concept as well that I was kind of trying to explore. So, yeah. I like that you have such 
a wonderful touch with the pencil that there are parts of this drawing that they really look crunchy. And then there are other parts that seem to just sink or other parts that feel more elegant. Like for example, you have this very tall vertical, which doesn't flow, but it has that, I guess, dynamic quality that sometimes you see when there's a branch moving across a tree. I'm so in love with this. It, it's so well done in terms of capturing that emotion because to me, a thumbnail can be sort of a mess, but the whole point is to capture the essence of that. And for you, the emotion is so important here and you're getting that in the thumbnail. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, uh, yes, I was surprised. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Why yeah. not surprised? Uh, I've seen you draw and I know you can do stuff like this. Well, I don't typically try to explore concept this way. I don't, I tend to, I tend to write a lot and I don't tend, I don't, I don't know why I don't do that. I just, I've never really done a lot of thumbnails and try to explore and, and in the moment while I'm drawing. Cause I tend to, I tend to lose focus, mm -hmm. I think. So I think this is a good way for me to explore now that I've realized because I can, I can, um, this is a chance for me to draw quickly and to get those concepts out and explore without deviating too far. Cause I'll, I'll, I'll spend an hour on a drawing and right. I feel like my style changes within, you know, that drawing. Cause I, I'll deviate. I'll be like, Oh, let's explore this instead. Yeah. So I know the feeling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's yeah. a really cool observation. And did you feel like the thumbnails you've done in the past, are more about the visual organization and less about the concept? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and trying to, uh, yeah, because I always, I, have, I struggle so much with conceptualizing, and mm -hmm. that's why I always figured that writing would be something, a good way to do that. But, you know, this has felt very natural, this yes. process. Which I really see that. Yeah. Yeah, it was really surprising to me. I was like, oh, okay, well, cool. You should do it more, yeah. Nandy, because the thing is oftentimes, yes, we can look at things and, and break them down visually in shapes and stuff like that, but so much of the type of shape that we choose definitely has an impact. I mean, if you think about shapes that tend to be round and organic are, are a little friendlier. You know, when you have things that have spikes on them, <laughs> they're a little bit more aggressive looking. So I would keep doing this in a couple more projects, Nandy, because it's working really well for you. Thank you. Um, I, I will. I definitely will, for sure. Awesome. Um, yeah. Thanks, Nandy. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Mildred, let's get you on voice. I see you have a spread. Yeah, I was really inspired by uh, Mr. Incredible. So oh, yeah? I played around with his um, anatomy and poses a bit. Good. Nice. Oh, these are already so much more expressive. What do you think? Yeah, I really like it. It fits his personality perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I especially like the one on the right where he's got his arms behind his waist and, and then that eyebrow <laughs> that's sticking up. I, I think keep exaggerating because it's really showing so much more personality with all of those shifts. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just noticed in the lower left-hand corner, that little jewel shape. How did you come up with that? Uh, I just paid attention to Mr. Incredible. He had like the, exaggerated torso and um, another artist way back taught me to correlate different anatomy to shapes so I was like oh this is a jewel shape. This is such a good example that you can take inspiration from other characters but still very much own your own character because I know a lot of people worry about that that oh this will look too much like this character but this is such a great example you took a fundamental concept from Mr. Incredible, and yet this is 100% your design. So good for you for applying it that way. I think perhaps the next stage of distortion would be 
So you see the guy in the middle, the really big one with his fist up. You can think yes. about twisting the torso. Okay, so let's say I'm standing upright, just a plain standing pose. And I twist my torso to the left, but I don't move my feet. My feet are doing the exact same thing. And I mean, do it right now. I'm doing it right now myself. <laughs> so I'm just going to twist the torso. And then you feel that twist because you've done it. And so if I look at the figure in your page, he doesn't have that twist of the torso. He's still pretty upright, even though he's in a fairly dynamic pose. So something that a lot of people do is they get into the pose of the character. So you can feel, oh, okay, where's that tension? Where is that bend really happening? And then you can know better what to emphasize in the drawing. Yeah. I used to do this thing whenever I taught drawing and we had a model, I'd have the model do pose and then I'd make everybody do the same pose. And you draw that pose differently once you've been in it because you start to realize, oh, this leg is bearing all the weight or this hand is just super relaxed and this part has a lot of tension. So anytime you can get yourself into that pose, I think it's a really worthwhile just physical experience to feel the pose that your character is making. I think that would be fun to try. Yeah, I just tried to do it too and it kind of hurts. Really. Yeah, it does. Like, like, <laughs> Twisting your torso. How do, you, how do you convert that emotion to the drawing? How? Oh yeah, I was thinking like yeah. to myself, how do you do that? You would probably, okay, so let's take the guy in the middle. All right, so if we look at his chest, that's a front view of his chest. Okay, now if we turn his chest to the left or to the right, we will no longer have, say, the chest looking symmetrical. Because when things are right in front of us straight on, they're symmetrical. You have the two um, biceps, the two collarbones and stuff like that. But the second you twist something, it becomes offset. So one collarbone is shorter, one collarbone is longer. So basically you get rid of the symmetry in order to show that shape. I mean, ideally you'd want to get a reference where you could see somebody actually doing that twist. And honestly, I, I just get my spouse and I'm like, can you pose like this? <laughs> you, it's so much faster than trying to find a picture online that matches that assuming you have family members who are willing <laughs> to do that for you. But have you ever shot your own reference photo, Mildred? Um, I don't remember. That's cool. Okay. You should try it. I mean, even for things like hands. So Neil was asking earlier about a hand and a hand is something that is really hard to make. I mean, I cannot do it. Like I need a reference. So you can even do it yourself. You can, I mean, Neil, if you're listening, you know what I would do? I would hold a pillow and, and I would make the pillow the baby and then I'd photograph my hand. Like, you totally can do that. So cool. I, I think you're well on your way, Mildred. Nice work. Thank you so much. Cool. And, and so now that I've mentioned it, I think I need to take a photo of this <laughs> for Neil. Just give me a second. I have to find a pillow. Because, see, th this is where it's like, and you guys will see me do this on video <laughs> because we're doing the recording. You, you just have to be willing to take these silly pictures of yourself in the name of your art. So, Neil, I'm trying to get a pose that's sort of similar to what you had. Let's see. Okay, this is awesome. <laughs> You, you guys are lucky I have no dignity left. So, Neil, I'm going to tag you on this. Um, Neil, do you want to hop on voice real quick? Tell me what you think of my reference photo. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah? What do you think? Do you think that would be helpful? Yes, it will be helpful. Super helpful. I, I, how long did that take? It took me like a minute. And of course, it yeah. depends <laughs> on what you actually want to do. I mean, sometimes you, you do need to spend a little bit more time, but it's 
kind of amazing to me that people spend so long trying to find a photo of that online when really shooting your own photo, number one, it's better because you get to be in control. And number two, it's just so fast sometimes. Cool. And Mildred, you don't have to hop on voice, but I'm going to send you an example of one of the types of reference photos that I've shot in the past because I, I would die. Like if you told me I couldn't do reference photos anymore, I, I think I'd like quit being an artist or something ridiculous like that because it's really something I can't live with. And my poor spouse is always the person who has to be a part of these little schemes. I'm trying to see if I can find it. I might not be able to, but I'll try my best. Yeah, I don't think I see it. Anyway, I'll see if I can dig it up some other time. Uh, Lisa, how about let's see how that thumbnail is going. see the one that says falling. Hey. All right. How are you, you doing with this one? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Falling is more, in, it's more fun for me than war. <laughs> <laughs> I can think. It's more specific, I would say. Yeah. And I just, I mean, I have no personal connection to war. So it was just uh, kind of a generic idea for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I can, I can, I've fallen down. So. <laughs> you have <laughs> Means personal <more>. experience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I really like the bend. Do you see the second one from the top? It, it feels like it's curving around a rock or something, but it's really subtle. I mean, I could look at this quickly and maybe not notice that. But then also the word that's the second from the bottom, I mean, that space between those two lower words is really good. And it's like, there's nothing back there. It's just with the stretching and distortion you're adding that creates that space. That's amazing. Yeah, I think uh, uh, your tutor. Uh, Ashley. Like on her name. Uh, Ashley. Ashley would be, I would be apparently kicked out of the... <laughs> Graphic design club, though, because I, I, I used to work full on a text. <laughs> Didn't she say that that was like a big no no? She did. And actually, that was one of the first things my spouse said to me when I showed him the thing. He said to me, The graphic designers will hate you if you do that. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, maybe we, should, we we're both like, Oh, it was fun to do. We love to yeah. do it. <laughs> I mean, it goes to show you how little I know about the field, but I think every field has things like that where it's like, no, I want to wring your neck for doing that one thing. Yeah. And we're like, what, what do you mean? I don't understand what's wrong with that. So it looks good, right? Oh yeah. I wonder why they're so, uh, you know, why it bothers them so much. Yeah, I don't know. There's probably some technical reason that maybe it's difficult to duplicate or something like that. But I, I, I just found that so funny, too. I, yeah, I, remember. Yeah. I really like the white negative space. The square is so simple, but you have that minor gradient on the left-hand side. I know we don't have a lot of time left, but if you continue working on this, I think it might be fun to play with the size of the square. Like, what happens when that square is very large and it goes off the page? What happens if it's... A little smaller what happens when it's tiny because that's really a major spatial relationship here i mean you have the space between the letters but a lot of it is the letters versus the square mm -hmm. yeah i i do think that this is where i need to go if i'm going to continue with graphic design is is taking very very simple shapes and exploring them with, with the text. Let me send you, I haven't put this together on the website yet, but Ashley sent me this wonderful PDF with all of these basics. I'm trying to see if I can find the one.
that has just this wonderful chart. Oh, here it is. Okay, I'll send you the link. But looking at this chart, I was like, oh man, I, I need to do like 500,000 of these exercises because I understand what this stuff is, but it's like the application of it within the context of graphic design is so foreign to me. Here it is. Yeah. Do you see I this? I see it. There's just so many versions of it. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Yeah, I agree. There's another one here. But what did you think, Lisa, about having more negative space? I always like it when I see it in things. Mm -hmm. So I like it when I see it. But like you, I want to fill the space. So yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. No problem. I, <laughs> cool. All right. Well, it's great to see that follow up, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. All right. Oh, and I see you did another one. Terrific. I, mean, I feel like I'm missing yeah. out on half the party. That's okay. <laughs> We're here for each other. Oh, good. Oh, Crispy, let's take a look at this. Last time I saw it, there was no paint. Hello. Hey, coming along. How's this going? Hi. It's going interesting. I definitely did not think it would be taking me this long. Uh -huh. I think I definitely underestimated how quickly I work. Or just the fact that it's 3D. 3D takes so much time. I mean, what, one example is that I taught a bunch of 3D classes in the beginning of my teaching career, and I swear it was four times the amount of work of a drawing class. It, everything took longer. And I just think that's inherent to doing anything three-dimensional, regardless of how simple it might look. Yeah, definitely. I find that the main problem I'm, I'm having is the paint isn't going on as smoothly as I want it to, uh -huh. or as flat. Because mm -hmm. I'm using a 2D reference, so I'm going to try and replicate that the best I can. It's pretty difficult to make that yeah. I don't know, connection. Mm -hmm. You use polymer clay? Uh, yeah, I used polymer clay and it's already been baked and sanded. So I'm pretty much painting like, I guess like a little model or a toy. So it's mostly just the painting. Okay. Remind me what kind of paint you're using. Uh, I'm using golden liquid acrylics or high flow acrylics. Okay. And I've never used those before, but they're thinner than acrylics, but they're not runny like ink, right? No, they're sort of like a mix between the both. They have pretty good coverage, but they dry really fast. So if oh. I were to put polymer clay sort of uh, cures like plastic almost. Okay. So if I were to do a thin coat of golden acrylic, it dries a little bit and then wash over it, it would sort of rub off the clay, okay. but like sort of pill or peel. So I've been trying to tackle that and just make really smooth washes quickly. Are you doing many layers? Uh, to avoid brush strokes, yes. Okay. I don't haven't used those before but I wonder if you could even sand it after you paint it I don't know it'd have to be really fine sandpaper but that could be an option because the combination of okay you've got the clay you've got the paint and inevitably it's not going to be so smooth because there's all these different factors but you might just pick a spot and if you have any sandpaper that's not crazy rough just do a little bit it, it might work it might not i've never done it before but that could be an option I actually tried that a little bit earlier because on the model i'm painting i'm using a plastic cutting mat and a little bit of the cutting mat stuck to the paint and i tried oh. to lightly sand it or like scrape it off and the paint peeled like oh, I see. fully off the clay okay, so bad. i think <laughs> i might need to look into I think I might need to look into putting like a primer on the clay to make the paint stick better or you something can. of that nature. Yeah, it's it's complicated. 3D, you just don't know 
how different materials are going to react with each other. I feel like that's half the battle of 3D, which adhesive, which paint, which clay. It's, it's all kinds of different decisions. But I, I love these, Crispy. I mean, I think it's great that you're working three-dimensionally. Do you feel like it's a nice complement to your 2D work? I think so. I definitely enjoy doing the little pins more, which I guess also counts as 3D work. But oh, of course. It's a lot more relaxed than this because it's only like one face and it's rounded. But I definitely think I'll continue doing these and I'd like to finish it, but it's definitely a lot more challenging than I originally thought. Yeah, it is. And that's why when people tell me they want to make this big sculpture piece, I'm like, no. Start small because you get into structural issues and those pins are a great way to get your feet wet, do a bunch of pieces and have it be low pressure. Because you guys, if you make a sculpture and it stresses you out, there is no stress like a sculpture that stresses you out. And if you can prevent yourself from that experience, I do recommend it. Yeah, I think this is also, I don't want to say serious because this is a very unserious piece that I'm working on, but it's pretty much the first time that I've tried um, attacking 3D work as like model painting or toy making or something yeah. of that nature instead of like a sculpture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it all More looking forward, goes to the same sorry. place. All of these decisions we make, whether they're in 3D or 2D, I think are all relevant ultimately. Yeah. But I'm definitely excited. I think I'm going to stop with the painting on it. I'm pretty happy with the coverage. So I think I'm just going to let it dry for a couple hours because, you know, let it hard cure and then try and go in with the resin and finish up the line art. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Crispy. Yeah, thanks again. This was a lot of fun. All right. We only have a few minutes, but uh, Chrissy, you want to hop on voice and quickly tell me how these other thumbnails went? Yeah, um, they went a lot faster once I started using a bigger brush. Yep. Um, and I decided to to explore instead of them standing, maybe sitting beside a campfire. Mm -hmm. um, I did two different very versions of that in the middle on the left and in the center, um, two different lighting versions, and then I decided to pull back and do a a distant one from above. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom three were kind of close-ups of the same thing in three different lighting conditions. Oh, I really like the bunch at the bottom. And then the one where they're seated, where they're very, very small, I think that one has a great sense of depth. So you, you did these very fast, Chrissy. I mean, there's a lot of them. And you've explored many different options. Like, I like that the house got moved. You added um, the windows to make them more prominent. So do you feel, Chrissy, like this was a, a fairly productive workflow for you? Oh, very much so. I feel like you helped me break the break where I was stuck and get to where I can actually do thumbnails quickly enough that they're useful. Because if you can't do them quickly, then they're really not thumbnails to me anyway. Well, they just take forever. <laughs> That's mostly the, Pardon me? Yeah. This is great, though. I mean, you, you can take a long time and do very detailed thumbnails, and I guess that's one thing. But when you're trying to explore different composition ideas, if it takes you forever to do them, um, you just don't explore as many. And you that's can't. not as useful in terms of the thumbnail you was supposed to be. Okay, everybody, we're going to wrap up now. I have a couple housekeeping things. So the first thing is that you guys do have access to this channel for a little bit since this program, Open Studios Club, is totally brand new. We're opening it as a little sandbox. And so once you've been given access to this channel, you can come back and check it out. But know that in between the live sessions, I will keep an eye on this channel to make sure it's moderated and you know, make sure the channel isn't burned down. But other than that, staff will not be active here giving feedback. 
if you have questions, if you need tech help, we can certainly do that. But that's where it does differ a lot from the Patreon group. Because the Patreon group, there, there's so much activity in between the channels, the voice sessions. So that's one big difference. But this was really fun, you guys. I, I just love how the conversations are so different. Like, I never know what you guys are going to bring up. And that's one of my favorite things, because as much as it is fun to have something to really focus on, it's also nice when things are just so spontaneous. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Great session. I will hopefully see you next time.